Welcome to First Baptist Church Online. I'm up here with one of our beautiful lakes in the background. I'll let you comment and tell me if you can guess where it is, but I want to invite you into our service today. It's been a hard week in our world, and we're going to struggle through some of that today in our prayer time, in our sermon time, and even in our worship time. Karen Feke is going to be leading us in worship, and then we're going to be entering a time of communion right after that. So. I invite you in and invite you to get some some bread and some juice as we come to that point so at this point i turn it over to karen as she leads us in worship thank you karen hello everyone this is new for me to be recorded everyone else here has lots of experience but i'm excited to enter into today's church service and worship with you Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, we thank you for this day. We ask that we might be a blessing to you. And we just want to thank you that we may even enter and come before you, our Holy God. And we can only because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. We desire to rejoice in you, um, to feel joy in you. So, Lord, we just pray that you would please bless this time. Amen. Today we look forward to Pastor Randy's uh, message from Acts 16. Paul and Silas have been severely beaten, and they end up chained in prison. They choose to pray and sing to God. I was reading the other day of another time when Paul ends up in prison again. He chooses to write to the Philippian church, and in chapter three he says, finally, my brothers and sisters, Rejoice in the Lord. It is a safeguard for you. I have lots of friends who are asking me, don't you get what's going on in the world, all this crazy control? And I think, what am I supposed to do, Lord? And I read chapter 4 of Philippians, and this is what it says. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in anything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, I, I just, I think about Jesus, right? He says, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Think about Jesus. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And here's his promise, that the God of peace will be with you. So let's, um, let's join and, and worship together. And we know that Christ is our salvation and he is victorious. So we're just going to rejoice that our Lord is King.
Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you that you are our salvation. You did what we could not possibly do, live a perfect life and take away our sins. Lord, we just want to thank you that we have this incredible hope in you that um, we can look all around the world and it seems like things are just crumbling, Lord, but you are our hope and um, we just want to thank you. Lord, we just want to look to you right now and um, we desire that um, we would be honoring and we would be glorifying you in what we do in our daily lives. Lord, we, we need your help with that, so we ask for that, and we ask it in the name of Jesus, and thank you for that. Amen. Thank you. Here's, um, here's God's word from Hebrews 6, verses 19 to 20. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul. It's firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf. He has become the high priest forever. This is our self, this is our assurance of salvation, and this is like real hope. Um, 
I mean, even that we can come into the presence of a holy God. We have this hope, we have this privilege, we even have this confidence that only because of Christ's work on the cross we can do this. So as we sing this last song, let's remind ourselves that we have a steadfast anchor for our soul. And Jesus has gone before us on our behalf. And he is our salvation. Welcome to our time of communion in our worship service this morning. And as you can see, we're in a different place. We were actually down at Suda Restaurant. And we have Dan Bay with us because we so miss his prayers when we're doing communion. We so miss all of our 
Korean friends in, in, uh, in fellowship and, and worshiping together. And, and so we are here to just lead in communion together as we come together wherever you are. We do want to just be with you on the screen, but be with you in, in love and in grace and in communion with our Lord. And so, as we get in, into it, we're going to read from 1 Corinthians, Paul's words. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So in that room, in the midst of just ordinary people, fishermen and tax collectors and whoever, so many people just like us, he took the bread. He broke it and he shared it. He gave it to them and said, this is my body, broken for you. And this is what we we're going to do this morning, hopefully sharing in your, in your home. We're gonna take the cup, as he did, and share it wherever you are. We can share this cup, this communion with our Lord. Let us pray. Lord, we just thank you that no matter where we are, how far apart we are, what our circumstances are, you are with us. And we can take up the bread and we can take up the cup and then we can remember you. We can remember your sacrifice for us. Where we can remember your love for us. Where we can, we can remember what you have done for us over, over and over again. Not just the once, but each day in our lives. We remember you. Amen. Sawing an anima abuji, Lavado Kamsar Trimida, Don Pian, Juil Ray, Rakachiaza, Inarichi, Ashin Hananim, Lavado Kamsar Trimida, Hananim, Joy Chigum. 코로나 19로 인하여 많은 어려움을 겪고 있습니다. 우리뿐만 아니고 전 세계인이 많은 어려움을 겪고 있습니다. 경제적으로, 신체적으로 하나님 이 모든 어려움들을 잘 극복할 수 있도록 하나님 도와주시길 원합니다. 특별히 하나님 함께 모여서 다시 하나님께 예배 드리기를 원합니다. 그날이 하루 속히 빨리 오게 하나님께 도와주시길 원합니다. 하나님 이 시간 우리가 하나님의 몸과 살을 나누길 원합니다. 하나님 그 속에 있는 하나님 그 의미를 우리가 깨닫고 그 의미를 생각하면서 하나님의 이 떡과 포도주를 나누기를 원합니다. 하나님 이 하나님께서 우리를 사랑하셔서 십자가에 달려 돌아가신 것을 기억하며 또한 그 사랑을 이웃에게 증가하며 나눌 수 있는 우리 형제자매 되기를 원합니다. 하나님 함께하여 주시옵소서 예수님 이름으로 기도합니다. 아멘.
the Israelite army had been conquering different kingdoms without defeat. They settled in the land of Moab. The king of Moab was Balak. Balak did not want to get attacked by the Israelite army, so Balak tried getting a prophet to curse the Israelites out of the land they were in. Balak sent some of his messengers to get the prophet Balaam to curse the Israelites out of the land. When the messengers arrived at the place Balaam was, they asked, Will you curse the Israelites out of the land they are in, so we won't get attacked? No. So the messengers went back to Balak to tell him the bad news. After Balak heard the bad news, he became desperate and told them to go back and offer Balaam loads of riches. So the messengers went back to ask Balaam again. Will you curse the Israelites out of the land they are in? We will give you loads of riches if you do. Hmm, I will go to the Israelites and say whatever God wants me to say. So the next day, Balaam saddled his donkey, and Balaam knew he should not go. God sent an angel to block the road. Balaam could not see the angel, but his donkey could. So the donkey tried going around the angel into the field. Balaam beat his donkey for going off the road. The donkey again tried getting around the angel and went up against the wall. Balaam's leg got scraped. Balaam was furious with his donkey and he gave it a good beating. The angel stepped back into a very narrow place in the road so that you could not get around it. When the donkey came up to the angel, he just stopped. Balaam was furious now. He beat the donkey as hard as he could. Then God opened the mouth of the donkey so that it could speak. What have I done to you to make you beat me three times? If I had a sword right now, I would kill you. Haven't I always been a good donkey? Well, yes. Then God opened the eyes of Balaam so that he could see the angel. Balaam knew he should have not gone with the men. Balaam bowed down to the angel and he said, Please forgive me for going with these men. I'll go back to my home if you wish me to. God wants you to go, but only say what he tells you to say. Hi friends. You heard recently that our beloved sister Eva Kettle passed away into the presence of the Lord on Tuesday of this past week. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about her life. I wrote down a few notes to remind me of some of the happenings in her life. She was born in Barrie, Ontario some 90 years ago. She was a child number 10 of a large, large family and accepted the Lord as her savior when she was only seven years old. But it was about that time that Mama and Papa, as she used to call them, separated and Eva and her siblings, five boys and five girls, were put into the Ontario Orphanage and the Ontario Children's Age placed them in foster homes. <clears throat> After graduating from high school, Eva began to teach in a rural grade school near Bracebridge, Ontario. And it was there where she, where she lived with the Kettle family on their farm. And, of course, that's where she met and later married John Kettle, her husband. They came out west for their honeymoon, picked apples, other fruit in the Chilliwack area, and it was good for Eva's asthma problem. John worked as a carpenter, and eventually they moved to northern BC, McBride, Tijon, Valemont, Jasper area. They were real pioneers at that time. John worked in carpentry and the logging business, and uh, Eva was a homemaker, because they had four children around that time. They went back to Ontario, then back to Valemont again. Donna was born in Jasper. Eva had to take the train to the hospital there because there was no hospital where they lived. Susan and Joan were, married, were born in Ontario. And their youngest son, Johnny, was born in the first aid station in McBride because there was no hospital at that time. Now this son, Johnny, married Kathy Gould in 1982, who's Eva Gould's daughter. He died tragically in a logging accident in the year 2001. But that's how the two Evas became so closely entwined. A beautiful mutual friendship that lasted the rest of their lives was forged right there. And it was there in Vilmont that Eva Kettle realized her greatest Christian ministry. She pastored a chapel in the town of Vilmont and Eva taught Sunday school and they ministered together. Uh, together with Eva Gould, Eva Kettle operated a Christian school there as well. 
she would travel to Prince George some 300 kilometers one way in the cold of winter to serve as a trustee for the Vailmont area. Snowstorms, poor roads, Highway 60 had just opened up. She was a pioneer. It was in the late 1980s that Eva and John moved to Vernon, British Columbia, and Eva became a faithful member of First Baptist Church. John passed away in November of 2017 at 91 years of age, and our sister Eva went home to glory this past week on June the 2nd, 2020. Now this is our prayer time, and I'd like to mention a few items for prayer before we give ourselves to prayer. First of all, we want to remember the family and the loved ones of Eva and John Kettle. Then we want to intercede for the victims of COVID-19. There's some 94,000 cases in Canada right now, 7,650 deaths, some 2,635 cases in BC, 166 deaths. We want to pray for those that are assailed by this terrible virus. Then we want to pray for the racial tensions in the U.S. and in the world, the inequality of the justice system, the law enforcement prejudice, the profiling, the brutality, the passionate demonstrations, the riots, the vandalism, and the violence of lawlessness in our streets, especially in the USA, but also in a certain measure here in Canada. The basis for our prayer is going to be 2 Corinthians, 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Friends, healing and reconciliation and justice starts with us as God's people. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, if there were ever a time for the need of healing in our land that is today, we pray for justice. We pray for moral integrity. We pray for understanding, for compassion, for mercy, for grace. We pray for those suffering from illness and disease, for those suffering from COVID-19, the psychological and mental traumas that this causes, as well as the physical deaths. We pray for the economic hardships that many are feeling here and especially in third world countries. We pray for the chaplaincy ministries here at the Vernon Jubilee Hospital where Grace Wolf is ministering and for the street ministries where Chuck Harper is engaged with his team. We pray for our pastors, Pastor Randy, Pastor Lori, we pray for our partners in mission missionaries, the Huttons in Bolivia, the Nachos in Costa Rica, Cheryl Bear in Canada. Oh Lord, may your mercy forgive us. May your love infuse us and may your grace empower us to live for you and to glorify your name. Amen. God bless you all. These past two weeks have shown us images that have burned into our minds. George Floyd, under the knee of a policeman, a law enforcement officer for nine minutes, resulting in his death, leading to day after day of protests, calling for justice. And thankfully, these have resulted in charges for all of the officers involved. But it's also led to anger boiling over, not just for George Floyd, but for the countless others, many of which we've heard their names over these two weeks. And yet this goes back for decades and even centuries of abuse and oppression. It's also led to looting and riots as some anger boils over, but also as many seek to undermine peaceful protests, inciting further anger and confusion and division. 
In these weeks, we've all begun to ask questions of who's right, who's wrong, and what is right, and is there justice? And thankfully, Scripture is not silent on this topic. In fact, as a people of the Word, those who week after week open this book and study it, we can be shaped by it and see that justice and righteousness are a key part of God's heart for us and for this world and for each person in it. I debated on scrapping our sermon series on Acts for this week, but when I read through the passage that we're going to look at, I knew we were meant to go through it. We've been challenged for these last two weeks to humble ourselves, not, not to give in to self-righteousness and anger and conflict. And by the way, uh, Pastor Lori, thank you for your great message last week. And if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to go back, watch it. And now in Acts 16, we see Paul and his entourage living this out. And there's a lot that we can learn from it. So I invite you to pray with me. And then we'll enter into this biblical story with John and Elaine Barling helping me read the passage. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come out of a service of worship to you and, and prayer and even communion, but with also heavy hearts. And we come to this text and we ask that you would teach us, open our hearts once again, and I ask that you would open my mouth to speak your living word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hello from uh, Middleton Mountain here, Elaine and John, and uh, ready to help do a reading here. We're going to be reading from Acts 16, verses 6 to 40. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia. From Troas we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, and the next day we went on to Neapolis. From there we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself, we are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him 
and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. When it was daylight, the magistrates set their officers to the jailer with the order, Release those men. The jailer told Paul, The magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, They beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens, and threw us into prison. And now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No, let them come themselves and escort us out. The officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Well, thank you, John and Elaine, for helping with that. We see that after Paul and Barnabas split ways in Syrian Antioch, that Paul and Silas travel up to Derbe and Lystra, where they had previously ministered. This would have taken them up through Paul's old town of Tarsus, and in that route they pick up Timothy, who becomes a key co-worker of Paul's. And they continue to travel, listening to God as to where to go. And they get a clear sense that they're not to go into Asia, which is where Ephesus is, straight west. They'll get there eventually, but instead they spend weeks on foot going northwest, ending up on the coast in Troas. And Paul has a vision. God is calling them to a whole new frontier, to Macedonia, across the sea. And this has got to be so exciting for them. And an, interesting, an interesting thing happens in verse 11. And I want you to take a look. We've seen verse 6. It was Paul and companions as they traveled before. But in verse 11, we see from Troas, we put out to sea. 13, on the Sabbath, we, 16, once when we were going. It seems that along this route somewhere, maybe it was in Troas, they were able to pick up Luke, and Luke has joined them on this part of the journey. Maybe that's one reason they had to go through Troas. We don't know exactly, but we know that Luke's with them, and they go to Philippi. And they introduce some God-fearing Jews and Gentiles to Jesus, including Lydia, a purple cloth dealer, which basically means she's high-end fashion, the Donna Karen of her day. And she invites them, all of them, to stay with her as they tell others about the King of Kings. Now we're going to learn a few things here in Philippi, but two that I want to point out and they come in these two acts. One, how to care for others in the midst of our mission. How to love others in the midst of our mission. And number two, how to hold those in power accountable to justice. So act one, the girl and the jailer, or how to care and love in the midst of our mission. So we start at verse 16. Once. Once when we were going to a place of prayer. Well, it seems like there wasn't a synagogue in Philippi. And in many major cities, there weren't synagogues. The farther you got away from Jerusalem. And that was always what they do, is go to the synagogue first. So here there isn't a synagogue, but there is a place of prayer where God-fearing Jews and Gentiles would gather. And so that's where they went, to meet with them and to share about Jesus, the true Messiah with those who are seeking after God. But, as verse 16 says, there, there was a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. Now this isn't Zoltar Speaks from Tom Hanks's movie Big. This isn't Esmeralda from Main Street on Disneyland. I'm sorry if that smarts for a few of you. I know it smarts for me, Disneyland. 
It's this, this young woman actually had this ability. And someone is making a fair amount of money off of her. She knows these things because of the Spirit, including that Paul and company are servants of the Most High God and have a message of restoration and wholeness in God, salvation. Now, as any good evangelist missionary will tell you, as you go into a new culture, it's important to build relationships and trust with your neighbors before sharing what Jesus has done for you. I know one person asked me, why would this be a bad thing? Why would Paul get upset? Well, you start sharing like this to people and you could end up sounding condescending and rude. If you don't believe me, just think of a neighbor that doesn't know you very well. Go up to their door, knock on it, and say, Hello, I'm a servant of the Most High God and I'm here to tell you the way to be saved. And just see how that goes. Now, yeah, sometimes God may use a very bold stance like that once in a while. But it's better just to get to know them, to hear their story, to let the sharing of your deepest questions and answers build and come more naturally. Well, Paul has ignored her for days, perhaps because she was a slave or a girl, either one were probably natural prejudices that he had. And in verse 18, it says it kept up for days, but Paul didn't want her doing this. Reminiscent of Jesus back in Mark 1 when the demons were speaking who he was and he shut them up. And he gets annoyed. He gets fed up so that he turns around. Now, fed up. The word here, the Greek word, actually means to be like uh, worked over. Worked over to the point of being worn out. And I think you know what that feels like. I think we all know a little bit of what that feels like in these days. Worked over and worn out. And so he turns and he casts this spirit out of her. He's had enough. Paul had spent all this time trying to do the work that God was calling him to do. Maybe he was preaching like Lydia to the other rich and powerful. Maybe that's what his goal was. And he didn't see that right in front of him all this time was this disturbed girl in need of freedom from the oppression and the abuse by her owners. And a little aside here, who do, who do you find annoying in your life? Maybe God is actually calling you to minister to them, to help, to help bring what Jesus has to offer them. Maybe some freedom, offering to make something right. Well, we don't know what happened to this girl. I often wonder, what's her story? And we don't get to find out because along with spiritual power coming against Paul, so does the power of profit. As those who own this slave girl have just lost some major income and they are not happy about it. Sometimes the good news of Jesus isn't received as good by some. And these businessmen abusing this young woman, using her for their own benefit, are very mad. They trump up some charges against Paul and company, and they incite some rioting in the town. And so the leaders have them beaten, and beat them severely and throw them in prison. Well, perhaps, perhaps Paul could have used his Roman citizen card and decided not to, or maybe he was gagged or discredited in some way. We don't know. But the next scene is great. It's midnight, and they're having a hymn sing in prison. An earthquake comes, and the doors fly open, and everyone's chains come loose. A radical grace. I don't think it's coincidence. And the jailer, the warden in charge of these guys, rushes over to the prison, concerned 
He had been told to carefully guard them in verse 23. And so he sees the doors are open and assumes, quite sanely, I think, that the prisoners have flown the coop, so to speak. And he's about to kill himself when Paul says, hey, you don't have to do that. We're all right here. Now, Peter had left when he was freed. And why would Paul stay? I think maybe perhaps after seeing God free the slave girl, just because he was annoyed, Paul begins to realize that ministry maybe isn't so much about the big picture all the time as it is about the one person right beside you. Who is your neighbor? Jesus was asked that, and he tells a scandalous story that highlights the frowned upon minority as the one who gets it right, who cares for the other in need. That is a true neighbor. Perhaps Paul had been doing some self-examination and learning from what Jesus had taught and turning toward it away from his assumptions and prejudices. No, they didn't run off because the life of this jailer would have been in jeopardy. Most likely, he would have been killed, which wasn't right, but it was the brutal Roman regime. And they stayed out of compassion and love for him. And the result? The result is that the jailer understands the radical nature of the love of Jesus, a love that kept Paul in that prison until the jailer was safe. A love that kept Jesus on the cross until our debt was paid. My father-in-law, a prison chaplain for over 30 years, understands this love. And Hannah, my wife, spent every Christmas Eve in jail, which is always really fun in Two Truths and a Lie. I've spent Christmas in jail. Now I've spoiled it for her to play it with any of you. But they ministered to those men behind bars out of love. While well, Paul and Silas sang in prison and were freed, and the jailer puts his confidence, his trust, he believes in Jesus' way, not Rome's, in Jesus as Lord, not Caesar. And often that's where we end the story, Act 1. But I want you to take a look at verse 35, where we see Act 2 of this story. Justice instead of power. And when it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. And the jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you can be released. Now you can go. Go in peace. And Paul says, They beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens, and they threw us into prison. And now, do they want to get rid of us quietly? No. Let them come themselves and escort us out. The righteousness of Jesus isn't just about personal transformation. There is also social righteousness, right living in the social sphere. It's often called justice. Justice that holds those in power accountable. Paul is not about to let these magistrates get away with their abuse of power. They don't get off easily just sending Paul away in peace. No, he's going to make them humble themselves and come down to his level. Come to the prison and face their mistake. He's holding them accountable. Now the term justice comes up in scripture around 150 times. And though we usually use the word to mean what someone gets when they deserve punishment, biblically, the main Hebrew word is mishpat. 
an expansive word calling for equality in all areas. It means that someone gets what they deserve, either negatively or positively. And punitive justice, well, that's easy. An eye for an eye. It's the justice of mercy that we find hard. Ensuring, as God tells us time and time again, to treat everyone as equal, as made in the image of God, especially those on the margins. And this goes way back. We can take a look. Exodus 23. It says, Do not deny justice to your poor people in their lawsuits. Deuteronomy 27. Cursed is anyone who withholds justice from the foreigner, the fatherless, or the widow. And then all the people shall say, Amen. Well, I'm not sure if everyone always says amen to that. Amen, by the way, doesn't mean goodbye or I'm hanging up as in the end of a prayer. It means so be it. So when they say that in Deuteronomy, that there's justice, we're to say, so be it. Isaiah says it like this, learn to do good, seek justice, rescue the oppressed. And we, we all know Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. And Amos goes even farther. You may remember the phrase, but let justice roll on like a river. Just listen to what comes before it. From Isaiah 5. 21. I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I have no regard with them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice Roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. Jesus was very clear about our attitude towards others and this justice as well. From Matthew 23, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint, dill, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, and mercy and faith. It is these you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others. Well, I grew up in a small town in Alberta. We didn't, we didn't have the same tensions of black and white that we see in our neighbors to the south. Though, I think each town is learning more and more this kind of diversity and some journalists say that we're not a racist nation here in Canada. But recent incidents, very recent incidents, and long-term studies don't necessarily agree. Or my own experience, for that matter. If the way I grew up talking about immigrants and the indigenous with my friends is any indication. As white settlers in North America, especially Christian white settlers, we have to ask ourselves if we have not slid comfortably into a prejudiced paradigm. Well, how can you tell? I know one exercise that I found on Be the Bridge says to list some races on a piece of paper. Very different people other than you. And then to write down all that comes to your mind as you look at those words, at these different groups of people. Be brutally honest, and you will find assumptions and prejudices. And once we begin to admit this, we begin to see what is possible, what's necessary, and what is demanded of us by God to see everyone made in the image of God, and then, not only to check off some imaginary box that says, okay, that's done, but to do justice, 
as Micah says, which means to fight for the rights of the oppressed, to see where justice is lacking in our world and do something, anything, to make it right. That's why the world is recoiled at the images of George Floyd, the brutality of racism, oppression, and inequality so blatantly seen goes against our inherent God-given desire for justice and righteousness. So what do we do? Well, we can sit and learn, and we can stand and act, and I think it's good to do it in that order. We can go back to history, like people like Dorothy Day or or William Wilberforce, or to John Woolman of Pennsylvania in the 1750s, who inspired his group of Christians to not only renounce slavery a hundred years before emancipation, but to actually pay back slaves for the time that they had stolen from them, even causing some believers to go bankrupt and to rely on others to help them get started again. These Christians were leading the way. We can read his journals and learn from John Woolman. Or to look at a more modern situation, Brian Stevenson, a black American and a great lawyer, is the author of Just Mercy, an incredible story, a book about hearing and learning about the injustices of the justice system in the U.S., where systemic racism causes many black Americans to face unfair imprisonment and wrong conviction. He has argued and won multiple cases at all the United States Supreme Court, including a 2019 ruling protecting condemned prisoners who suffer from dementia, and a landmark 2012 ruling that banned mandatory life imprisonment without parole sentences for all children 17 or younger. It's hard to believe that those were laws. And he and his staff have won reversals, relief, or release from prison for over 135 wrongly condemned prisoners on death row. And won relief for hundreds of other wrongly convicted or un fairly sentenced. An incredible story. As a young lawyer, he recalls his first visit to an inmate who had been wrongly accused, and how, when the guard came to take the inmate away, tightening the handcuffs and leg chains too tight, the prisoner said, don't worry about me, Brian, just come back and visit. And then he watched as that inmate paused in the doorway, lifted up his head, and opened his mouth. Then, like Paul and Silas, he began to sing, Lord, lift me up and let me stand. A higher plane that I have found, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Uh, Yes, I know, I spared you from my voice. But I think we'll get a chance to sing it later. Brian Stevenson's organization is called Equal Justice Initiative. And you can support them. Support.ejji.org We need to sit and learn. Brian's book is a great start. It's also an audio big form. And if you're saying, Randy... Oh, Randy, if it was only a movie, then at least I could make that much effort. Well, you're in luck. It is. You could rent it this afternoon or tonight. Just mercy. Look it up. Now, we can learn the word ally, meaning how to come alongside people of color or black, indigenous people of color, BIPOC, learning about and supporting them, not assuming that we know what's best for them, because that's how a lot of this mess got started. As Jesus calls us to love our neighbor, we need to acknowledge that we have many minorities around us. And I'm so thankful that as a church, we've intentionally included our Korean immigrant brothers and sisters 
Now, maybe for you it felt a little strange to do communion from the restaurant today. But I say, why not? We came to Dan, to Bay Minho. And we have much to learn from our Korean brothers and sisters. And we have much to learn about our indigenous neighbors, about what was promised to them and what was taken from them and what justice looks like for them and to what God is calling us to do about it. And that's why over these last two years, we've spent time in our charting a course for conciliation workshops, hearing their stories, engaging and learning from them. And I say not reconciliation, but conciliation, because we're just getting to know our Okanagan Silek neighbors. It's not easy to hear all their stories, to face our past, to wonder what we can do about it. But God has not given us a spirit of fear or timidity, but of love and of power, power that can be used for good instead of the power that has been used for evil. Brian Stevenson's grandma used to tell him, and she would hold him in a tight hug and say, you can't understand the important things from a distance, Brian. You have to get close. And it's been an honor to hear some powerful stories to get close to some people. Paul got close to that slave girl out of his annoyance. He got close to that jailer. And he made those magistrates get close to him to understand Jesus, 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 Jesus loves me. But we truly actually wonder, not so sure about others. And I don't think we can keep singing Amazing Grace if we don't believe that it's truly offered to all and we learn to offer it. And we might have to stop singing Great is thy faithfulness. If we're not willing to be the faithful to answer the call God is giving us to the oppressed and marginalized. And if we sing higher ground, which I'll invite you to do in a moment, let's realize we are all in need of being raised up from our brokenness into his wholeness that we all need to be raised to new heights. It takes a humility, a humility to understand when there's been an imbalance of power. But the good news of Jesus is he's showing us, he's showing us his way, and he is ready to empower us to live as we were created to, as we long to for true justice and righteousness. The world is calling out for justice, like the prophets of old. Perhaps we can be an example of humbly learning, sitting down and listening, and then standing up and acting for justice, seeing and loving all of our neighbors. Let's pray together. In this day and age, Jesus, we ask that you would show us who is our neighbor, how to act in love in that moment, and how to stand up for justice, how to learn what we need to. May your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. May your will, your justice be done through us. In Jesus' name, amen.
progressing on the upward way new heights are gained in every day still praying as I onward bound Lord plant my feet on closing blessing and benediction come from the words of a Canadian missionary living and serving in Belize and I just received this email from Rob Ogilvy our executive minister for the CBWC and these words come from Alicia Dewberry so I encourage you to open your hands and to receive these I don't know exactly what steps can be made to solving the racial divide but I have a humble suggestion. Go to your friend who is eating different foods and share them with her. Sit for tea with a friend who has different skin color and tell stories and ask questions and be open and hearing and kind and inquisitive. Pull into a driveway and make a new friend. You might just find that your new friend who looks nothing like you has a heart for you, has dreams and hopes for your kids and their community, and has kindness to share. Look for it. Intentionally create spaces for connection. So may you go in the power of the Spirit, looking for love and justice. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey.
Okay, Dan, what do you suggest out of your menu for me who does not like spicy? Hot, hot. Hot, hot? Yes, hot. Hot? Yes. Hot? The rest is uh, not spicy. spicy. Oh, yeah, wow. Spicy, yeah. Okay, so as long as I pick something that doesn't have a pepper on it, <laughs> I'm okay. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and you haven't even have gluten free. Look yeah, at that. yes, gluten free. My mom could come over and have yeah. have, have uh, lunch here. This we, is great. Yes, we have a vegetarian and vegan and gluten free menu. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Wow.